Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Glover Cottages, which is the home of the Australian Institute of International Affairs in New South Wales. My name is Robert Pritchard. I'm Vice President of the Institute in New South Wales. Um, and I apologise tonight for the absence of our uh, President, Colin Chapman, who's in Europe um, and in Poland as we speak. Um, before I introduce our uh, guest speaker tonight, uh, can I just mention to you that our uh, next week's event on Tuesday the 11th of September uh, is an event involving an examination of modern terrorism. Um, it's, a, it's a review of the 11 years that have passed since 9-11. And we've, we've got um, a top-line speaker uh, by the name of Clive Williams coming along uh, to address us on this, uh, who's a, uh, uh, a very, very well-known identity in the field. And so I do encourage you and your friends to come along and, and be updated on that. But tonight it's, it's um, my very great pleasure to chair this meeting and to introduce to you uh, David Byers. Uh, David I've known for a number of years. Uh, he's currently the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association, which is a long-winded way of uh, explaining what APIA is. And APIA uh, is the body that represents the petroleum industry and the gas industry in this country. Uh, David's based in Canberra and he's come up uh, this afternoon especially to address the Institute tonight so we're very grateful to him for doing so. Uh, David's uh, background is actually uh, in economics and law, not in uh, the technical side of the industry, but he's uh, been involved in the industry uh, intimately for many, many years uh, with working for uh, Woodside, uh, working for uh, ExxonMobil, uh, and then subsequently in public policy uh, as the Chief Executive of CEDA, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia, and then most recently uh, appointed as the, uh, as the Chief Executive of, of APIA. Um, APIA is an organisation uh, which represents uh, all of the interests and stakeholders in the petroleum production and exploration area, an absolutely key field for uh, uh, the Australian economy. David's going to be talking to us tonight um, not only about the Australian uh, industry but about the Australian industry in its international context and this being an international institute, of course, we're going to be particularly interested to uh, hear what he's got to say about that. Um, last uh, week I went to see the Beach Boys uh, and, and uh, the, uh, uh, the chief uh, of the uh, Beach Boy team uh, announced at the beginning of the, uh, of the uh, concert that the concert fell into two parts. The first part and the second part. <laughs> now tonight we have two parts. The first part will be David's address uh, and he's got a slideshow to accompany that and the second part will be Q&A and we hope to finish by, uh, by 7.30. So while David's addressing you, think about the questions uh, because I'm looking forward to a really uh, interesting interchange and Q&A session afterwards. But can I now please welcome David Byers and ask him to address us. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, Bob actually is our chair tonight, knows about as much about this subject as I do, so when we get to the Q&A session I'm going to be calling on Bob for some help. And also sitting in the front row here, of course, is Keith Orcherson, who for many years was the uh, Chief Executive of APIA. Um, so, and Keith still writes very frequently and very avidly on all manner of energy topics, so <clears throat> I feel like I've got some help and maybe to continue the uh, Beach Boys theme, there's some good vibrations in the room. Um, 
the, uh, the Institute, uh, I know a little bit about the Institute. I was actually a member of the Institute myself in Victoria when I was living in Victoria, but having moved to Canberra, I've kind of fallen out of the, uh, by the wayside. And uh, one of the things that I really did enjoy about the Institute, at least uh, when I was uh, involved, was the fact that uh, they had a capacity for very um, stimulating discussions. So I, I'll try not to go on for too long so that we can have uh, maximum time for input questions and comments uh, and so forth. So with that, um, I did want to talk about the role of uh, Australian natural gas in the Asian century. And the way I propose to, uh, to cover that is by <coughs> Firstly, giving you a bit of an overview of the industry, because I think that helps. Some of you may know a lot about the industry. Some may know a little less. Um, then I want to cover some of the current developments and future prospects. Uh, thirdly, I'll touch over lightly the uh, coal seam gas, given that we're here in New South Wales. I'm sure there's some interest in how that fits into the mix. And fourthly, uh, talk about some of the challenges to the industry's uh, growth prospects that Australia in an international context again. Firstly, uh, well, Bob has really introduced APIA, so I won't uh, talk too long on this one, but essentially APIA is what we call the peak council for all the oil and gas industry in Australia, the upstream part of the industry, which is the exploration and development, project development and production phase part of the industry. You'd be familiar with the downstream as you see the service stations and the uh, refining and marketing assets. That's a different part of the industry, not one which, um, which uh, I represent. Um, but we do have, uh, as APA, coverage of around about 98% uh, of the industry and that's made up of about 90 full member companies. So all of the, the household names in this industry, along with some of the major um, services companies that are providing goods and services to the industry. All right, uh, lots of numbers here. I'm not going to take you through each one. You'll be happy to know. But I did just want to give you a bit of a sense of uh, the significance and size of the industry uh, within an Australian context. Um, <clears throat> the industry is responsible for 58% of Australia's primary energy consumption. And by that I mean this is all of the oil and gas which is consumed as part of the energy mix in Australia. It includes the transport sector, so petrol uh, as well, but it does give you some sense of how um, strongly represented this sector is in the uh, consumption of, industry, of energy in Australia. Um, another point that I'll just touch on really is um, that the numbers show quite a different uh, story when it comes to oil and gas. <clears throat> You'll see here some numbers up on the chart there that, where I've said that gas reserves to production is over 80 years, and I'll come back and talk about that a little bit uh, in a moment, but what I'm saying there is that, the, that uh, we have sufficient reserves to cover 80 years of production at 2020 levels, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But uh, by contrast, in the, uh, with regard to oil reserves, we're looking there at about 13 years of production. Ga uh, Australia has become very much known as a, a, uh, a gas producer rather than an oil producer. Um, uh, since the early discoveries in uh, Cooper Basin and Bass Strait, we've tended very much to be uh, a country that produces a lot more gas. It's just the geology which surrounds and is uh, onshore in Australia, which uh, that reflects. Okay, <clears throat> this gives you a little bit more of a, a graphical look at uh, the picture in Australia. And before I plunge into some of the numbers on the chart here, I just want to give you a little bit of a, a, uh, a guide as to some of the terminology that I'm going to use. I'm talking primarily tonight about natural gas. I'll talk a little bit about oil, but primarily it's a, it's, this is a gas story. And <clears throat> natural gas, or what we call methane, comes from uh, four rocks, sandstones, carbonates, shale and coal. And uh, it's the same gas, it's methane, whichever way that, uh, that we deliver it, and it also has the same end uses, whether that be for residential use or in power generation or whatever that might be. The terminology of conventional or unconventional <clears throat> really refers to the way in which we bring it to the surface. In a conventional uh, operation, 
You simply drill a well, you fit the well head to contain the gas, and the gas is driven to the top by the natural pressure that it's under. In an unconventional mechanism or an unconventional process, we're having to take an alternative approach to bring the gas to the surface. And there's really two major methodologies here with what we call tight gas or shale gas. <coughs> um, primarily, you've got reservoirs which have got gas in them, but it's impermeable rock. So you need to do something to be able to stimulate the, rock, the, uh, the gas flow through the rocks. And that's the process of fracking, which you'll hear about. And the <coughs> second one is with regard to coal seam gas, where the gas is held within the coal seam by the pressure of the water. And the way in which we bring the, the gas to the surface there is by dewatering the coal seam. That pressure sort of is released and the gas rises to the surface. So when you hear me talking about those things, that's what I'm talking about, conventional and unconventional uh, resources. So Australia has around 320 uh, trillion cubic feet we, call, we, we talk about in reserves. <coughs> uh, that's made up of 164 in conventional gas and coal bed methane or coal seam gas as we call it predominantly is around about of a similar order. Um, currently we consume about uh, one TCF or one trillion cubic feet domestically in Australia and we export about one trillion cubic feet. In 2020 through some of the projects and the exports that I'm going to talk about a little bit later we're projecting that to go to a balance of around about 2.2 trillion cubic feet being exported, leaving um, 1.8 uh, trillion cubic feet here for domestic consumption. So we have about 80 years of uh, known reserves. That's that 80 years figure that I spoke of before. But that doesn't take account of uh, the third source in the chart there, showing around about 400 TCF of shale gas. And uh, that's very, it's a very new story in Australia. Uh, it's early days, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about shale gas later on in the talk. Uh, but what I will say as well is that none of these numbers take account of technology. And there's been some radical changes in technology in the last even 10 years, which have uh, increased our ability to be able to economically or commercially recover a lot of the gas from those different source rocks. All right. <clears throat> what that means for Australia is uh, that um, we're embarking on a, a very, it's a tremendous growth phase that we're in at the moment. Um, in fact, globally, eight of the 14 LNG plants which are under construction or are firmly committed are here in Australia. It's a sort of growth phase that we haven't seen before in our industry and we haven't seen it so geographically confined as it is. Um, that is, increased production capacity is set to push Australia up to uh, second behind Qatar by about 2020 and rivalling Qatar as the major uh, source of uh, gas for the world. Um, now what is driving that of course is something as you members of the Institute would know is this dramatic shift which is occurring between West and East in the world driven by industrialisation and urbanisation in places like China and similarly in some of the developing countries through Asia. That, that's changed the dynamics of what's happening in the industry and it's changed uh, really also the product and the uh, capital markets with it. So I want to talk a little bit more about that but probably the simplest way to show that is if you look at this picture those of you who've been there, Shanghai, 1990, not all that long ago for someone like me, I can remember being there around about that period. I haven't been back really for probably, probably it's probably about six years, but then if you look at Shanghai now, you'll see that it's a radically, uh, well in fact in 2010, it's a much uh, different story and that represents the growth that I'm talking about in the area that we know about. Mm -hmm. But let's uh, just uh, take a closer look at that global picture before we uh, burrow a little bit deeper. Um, <clears throat> firstly, uh, if we just uh, take here some uh, figures from the International Energy Agency, which is an authoritative group. I mean, everyone has their favourite forecaster, I suppose. But the International Energy Agency is a, an NGO, a non-government organisation, which is supported by many of the governments around the world, a very authoritative source for some of these projections. It's put together in the middle of last year uh, an updated gas scenario which 
really asked the question as to whether we're entering a global age of gas, it called it. And that was off the back of gas becoming, by its projections, the second biggest energy resource uh, by 2030, um, taking over from uh, coal uh, and just behind oil. But also because, you can, as you can see from the chart there, that upward incline, which shows that gas of all those major sources of energy is growing at the fastest rate, around about 2.2% compared to an average growth rate of energy globally of about 1.2%. So <clears throat> what that means is that um, natural gas is very much becoming a major part of the global energy supply mix. So why natural gas? Why are we seeing this kind of growth occurring? Well, there's several reasons for it, and I guess we can handle this a bit more in questions if we want to go into more detail. But what's happened really has been, I suppose, a new look at the abundance of gas. Because of some of the technologies which have occurred over the last, really the last decade, with being able now to extract unconventional resources, um, <clears throat> we're looking, the IEA is projecting that we've got something like 250 years of supply and conventional resources, or sorry, unconventional resources are matching the supply coming from unconventional resources. The interesting thing as well for you who are involved in looking at international trends is that um, unconventional resources are very much more widely geographically dispersed through the world, so it's changing some of the supply and demand patterns and mixes. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but the net effect is that when we think about gas now, certainly as an industry, we're no longer thinking about gas as a transitional source. We're thinking about it much more as an enduring source of energy. Probably the second thing is that um, gas is readily available. It's able to be transported by either pipeline or I'm going to talk mainly about LNG, which is a process whereby you freeze the gas to minus 261 degrees centigrade so that you can transport it over long distances. It makes it economic to transport. They're the two primary mechanisms, but what it means is it's becoming much more of a global resource as well. Um, the third characteristic is to, which is driving this is that gas is a very flexible resource. It's one of the few resources, for example, that competes against all other energy sources in all other in energy markets, from power generation through to residential use, indeed even through to uh, transport usages now with some growth even in uh, transport usages in the United States particularly using either compressed natural gas um, or uh, indeed for commercial operations even some LNG. So it's becoming much more a, uh, a, an issue for um, um, transport usage and also using LNG fuel for shipping. Um, Thirdly, it's affordable. Um, power plants for gas-fired power plants are around about half the capital cost of coal and about a third the cost of uh, nuclear. So it has some cost advantages in that regard. That's just talking about the application rather than the entire the, uh, the product cost itself. And it's, it's efficient and uh, it's clean in comparison with other uh, dominant sources of energy. Um, even in CO2 emissions, it's around about 50% less CO2 emissions than coal, up to about 80%, depending upon in power generation, the kind of process that you use. So those are the sort of reasons which are driving that sort of growth pattern uh, in gas. Okay, and uh, looking then at breaking that up around the world, this is sort of where the global gas demand is coming from. And <coughs> Wood Mackenzie, which is another one of the industry forecasters, casters, is forecasting that global demand is going to increase in the, Asia, in, the uh, uh, in the globe by around about 60 TCF per year. Most of that, as you can see from the chart, is in the Asia Pacific region. Most of that's on our doorstep, so there's an enormous opportunity for Australia. But as we say in the industry, and one of my points tonight is that there's no guarantee of success, and we can't take that for granted. So I want to just now cover a little bit more in more granularity, as it were, <coughs> what's happening in Australia. Uh, at the moment we have three existing LNG plants which are sort of feeding this growth, uh, and this map shows the location of those. The first one and the largest one was the Northwest Shelf Project. 
which started uh, supplying LNG back in 1989 and uh, predominantly to the Japanese market but also into Korea. The second was commissioned in 2006, that's Darwin LNG, of course, in Darwin, um, one of the smaller LNG plants around the world. And then finally, uh, in April of this year, Pluto, which is just on the other side of the Burrup Peninsula in the northwest shelf area of Australia, was commissioned, um, which means that with those three projects, Australia is exporting around about 20 million tonnes of LNG around the world. What's interesting, though, is to look at what's happening in terms of that, that investment story that I talked about. There's seven uh, major projects which are under construction. Um, we have, um, just picking them off here and saying a little bit about each, Gorgon, which is a very large uh, LNG project, Wheatstone and Ichthus up in the north, which is a, a tremendous project, which is just off Darwin, bringing gas to shore about 900 kilometres by undersea pipeline into Darwin, a processing plant to be developed in, in Darwin. And then Prelude, which is uh, shown on the chart there as well, is a, the first and largest floating LNG development in the world. It's one which can minimise the amount of infrastructure which is required to develop uh, a gas resource. You don't have to bring it to shore. You can actually do all of the processing in what amounts to a huge ship which is uh, floating offshore. And it means that we can monetise or, or bring to commercial actuality a number of projects which may not be otherwise able to be economically produced. And then we've got the three CSG to LNG projects uh, around Gladstone. Uh, Queensland Curtis LNG, Gladstone LNG and Australia Pacific LNG. Together those projects amount to something like 180 to $185 billion and many thousands of new jobs. Um, to give you some idea of the size of these projects, I know you see sort of, you know, a representation of some ships on a chart and it's kind of hard to see how big they are, but probably the most iconic project in Australia's history would be what? Keith? Oh, in terms of uh, energy, it would have to be the Snowy, wouldn't mm. it? So Snowy Mountain Scheme. If we did the Snowy Mountain Scheme, we looked at that in today's dollars, that would be a project worth around about $8 billion. Well, each of these projects are bigger than the, uh, the Snowy Mountain Scheme, each of them individually, and one of them, which is Gorgon, is about five times the size of the Snowy Mountains. It's about a $43 billion project. So, you know, I know it sounds like a lot of numbers, but when you think about it in that context, you can see that we're talking about a very, very large capital investment. And it's been common, I think, to look at the resources sector, and we've seen a debate in the, in the popular press in the last couple of weeks about whether the resources boom is over. And, <clears throat> you know, that's been borne by a sort of downshift in commodity prices. Well, I can say that certainly in this industry, in the LNG industry, uh, the boom's not over. Um, $180 billion of that investment is committed, and the reason why it's different is because in order to get that amount of investment financed and the project going, they need to be secured by long-term 20 to 25 year contracts. So it's a different dynamic which is at play compared to those of you who are familiar with, say, the iron ore industry, which has sort of much shorter cycles of contracts, three to up to uh, 12 month contracts. These are very long-term contracts. So to that extent, that investment is very much committed and it's, it's locked in. But the interesting part of the story as well is what happens next. And there are a number of, um, beyond those committed projects, there's a number of other projects which are at various stages of active consideration. Some of them are well advanced, some of them are less so. But three or four of those projects which are shown in black there on the chart, the black ships, um, not sure that's sig significant <laughs> or represents anything, but um, they're reaching their final investment decisions either in 2013 or 2014. So it won't be long before we know whether those projects are going to go ahead as well. So that is, you know, by the best estimates, I can't be specific on this, but, you know, by best estimates, 
there's potentially another 100 to 150 billion dollars worth of investment which is really something which is going to be determined over the next one to two years in most of those cases so the picture I'm giving you is that there is a you know a huge tremendous growth phase occurring in Australia at the moment some of which is committed some of which depends upon how well we're able to manage that growth and how well we're able to bring and deliver those projects. Um, what that all means is that um, I talked a little bit before about Qatar, but this is a, a graph which just shows you the major LNG suppliers in the world. And you can see there that uh, Qatar, shown by the, um, on the graph there, if you just look at the red piece of the bar there, that's actually LNG, which is operational, projects which are operational. That has by far the largest market share, as you can see, around about 80 million tonnes uh, is supplied out of Qatar. I think, I think the exact number is, in fact, 77 million tonnes. But with that committed investment from Australia and that under construction, we look like being by around about 2020 up there with Qatar, similar in size and uh, significance as a supplier into the global market. And of course, if those other projects which I described were all to come to fruition, then we'd be a much more um, significant supplier again. I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here. Um, this next chart shows you, um, again, I don't want to pepper you with too many numbers, but I think this sort of makes the point that when we think about the resources sector, there's a tendency very much in Australia to think about iron ore and coal. When in reality, if you look at where the investment go is going, it's going into the oil and gas sector, and specifically into the gas sector, about 75% of all of the investment. And again, just to give you one more figure, um, committed investment of that 75% there is shown on the chart. That actually, if you think about all of the investment, private investment in Australia, which is going into the Australian economy at the moment, 35% of that is going into the LNG sector. So. Think about that, just over a third of all investment in this country is going into the LNG sector. So that, if nothing else gives you a tangible sense of what's happening in the industry, then that certainly should. All right, but on to some of the international aspects um, once again. I've got this chart here which just shows you some of the global LNG trade movements. And <coughs> It, it really, I think, does make emphatically the point that LNG is very much a globally competitive game and we therefore can't take Australia's place within it for granted. Uh, if you look at the chart, if you see the, um, the blue lines there, they represent the LNG flows and the red lines represent um, pipeline flows. Um, there's been a growing global trade in LNG. Um, one of the reasons, as well as those sort of advantages, if you like, of natural gas that I described uh, before. One of the other reasons why we're seeing such a global trade emerging is because of um, more of a focus on energy security and fuel diversification policies by different countries. Um, Australia's major export markets are uh, Japan with about 73 to 75 per cent of our total supply going into Japan. China has about 19%, has been very much a fast mover in uh, that overall demand mix, and South Korea has about 4 to 5%. So you can see that we're out currently, we've got major uh, resource uh, export volumes bound for those three countries, with some small export volumes going to Taiwan and India. Um, but a lot of the competition that we face is from countries like um, Qatar, Indonesia, Malaysia and Russia, countries like that. So uh, this is very much a globally competitive game. And one of the things which is, I think everyone is interested in tonight, it was one of the, the topics which was set up was, well, what about the US? I just want to show that on the next chart. Um, the question of the US and, uh, is, is a very interesting one. It's been the subject of a lot of speculation. Um, there's no doubt that there's an enormous uh, resource there in the US, um, the, driven really by its large shale gas resources, which have really only come into play in the last decade, really. I mean, and even substantively in the last eight years. It's been a relatively short period of development time. Um, and it's changed the face of US energy and US security, energy security, therefore. And also, 
a country that we really is not shown on the chart there we should think a lot about is, is there's been some recent discoveries in East Africa, about 100 trillion cubic feet, in other words about two thirds of what is in Australia's conventional supply base um, has been discovered off uh, East Africa and you know likely developments into Tanzania and Mozambique. So <clears throat> you can see that the picture is one where there's a lot of uh, competition. And the question, I suppose, is, well, what impact is that going to have on Australia? What does that mean for Australia's uh, LNG market share? I guess the first thing I would say about that is that primarily the growth area is in the Asia Pacific and Australia is well geographically placed there. So that's one thing that we have in our favour. Um, the other thing which we have in our favour is simply the size of market. If I look at what the size of that market is now in Asia Pacific, it's about 150 million tonnes per annum. We project by around about 2025 that that will go to about 300 million tonnes per annum. So there's a large amount of growth there which we want to be competing for a share of. The second thing, and, and, but I, and the reason why I guess, at least in my perspective, we should have some confidence in Australia as to the prospects of our own industry here to be able to compete in that global framework is for a couple of reasons. I think when it comes to the US, the US has probably going to be very focused on its own domestic energy security after having come through a period where it's been a very big issue for the US in its psychology, if you like, of being, being seen to be reliant upon um, supplies uh, of energy from the Middle East. It's now in a situation where it has relative energy security domestically. It also has some supplies coming in from Canada. And I think it's going to be reluctant to, if you like, from a political perspective, to be prepared to um, uh, push a lot of uh, product out into the export markets when there's such a large um, demand locally. The second thing is that um, those Australian projects that I uh, mentioned before, the seven that are under construction, along with the three which are, have already been built, there's a there's sort of they've been successful in being able to supply into the window in that sort of worldwide supply which exists now. Um, they're underpinned by long-term contracts, as I mentioned, 20 to 25 years. So to that extent, they've already got secure customers in place. And when it comes to East Africa, while it's a very, very large resource, and I think it's going to be probably a low-cost resource, a low-cost environment to be able to develop those projects, there's low levels of infrastructure in, in places like Tanzania and Mozambique. Um, so the time to develop those projects may, may well be a lot longer than people think, even though the resource base itself is a very, very large and substantial one. But we need to think, though, that uh, this, it's certainly the case that there are, on the other side of the coin, some challenges for Australian projects. The primary challenge of which is that we are quite a high-cost environment. There's a bunch of factors for that, but uh, you know, uh, some of them are reflective of the strong state of our economy here in Australia, where you have um, product prices which are written in US dollars, but all our costs locally for development are in Australian dollars, and there's been, as we all know, a big increase in the Australian, in the, uh, 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 the Aussie dollar. So that's been a factor which has meant that there's high development costs here and there's a bunch of other things which I'll talk about in a moment. So it's certainly not without its challenges but we have some reasons for some confidence that the Australian projects that I've described can compete pretty well and effectively into those marketplaces. All right, let me switch very quickly to um, coal seam gas, and I'm only going to cover this over lightly. We can talk about this in the Q&A if you wish. Um, <clears throat> it's important, I think, to recognise that um, coal seam gas is not such a new story, uh, but the growth of the industry in onshore eastern Australia has been. Um, you see the chart up there. You can see that the production profile has been one where in 2004, production really started to take off to the point where now a third of Australia, Eastern Australia's gas is actually coming from coal seam gas. Um, in Queensland, 90% of the gas supply comes from coal seam gas. So there's been quite a, um, a strong development profile. 
Predominantly the reserves are in Queensland. If you look at the Surat Basin, that's the major uh, Queensland reserve. And then you see some of the, and the Bowen Basin, and the balance really are the New South Wales Basin. So you can see predominantly from a reserve point of view and a resource point of view, then uh, it's primarily in Queensland, but there are some very large and important resources as well in New South Wales. Um, the issue, and I suppose when, when it comes to what sort of things um, are we concerned about as an industry or what sort of things could impact on the development profile of, of uh, resources like CSG, it really comes down, I suppose, the predominant thing for CSG is this social licence to operate issue. It's a very important one for the industry. And I suppose the way I would sort of come at that is to think about this in terms of individual companies manage their own reputation and their operating practices, but the social licence to operate is earned by the industry. So what it means that, that is there's a focus across the industry on how we do things rather than just within individual companies. And the three major things that we're focused on there have been the, the issue of engaging effectively with local communities and landowners, making sure water management practices and water resources are protected, and also that there's more of an understanding of hydraulic fracking. It's a process which has been in use in the industry for around about 60 years. The numbers around the world are something like two million wells which have been fracked. It's been studied exhaustively. It's a well-known technique. but there's no doubt about the fact that we haven't been able to, as an industry, communicate very effectively that this is a well-known and well-tried uh, technique. And we can talk a little bit more about that, I guess, in the Q&A um, as we um, go through it. But I just wanted to, finally, on coal seam gas, perhaps just give you a sense of, of um, on each of those issues, it's very much a tale, if you like, of two states. This is what's happening in New South Wales versus what's happening in Queensland. And just a couple of things that I'll point out to you. Clearly there's a, a larger number of um, CSG wells being um, developed in Queensland and explored in Queensland compared with in New South Wales. Effectively the industry has been uh, ground to a halt in New South Wales because of some of the, uh, these public uh, concern issues. Um, the challenge in New South Wales really is going to be to get development of the industry going to meet some of the indigenous needs here in New South Wales for gas because 95% of the gas which is supplied into New South Wales comes from outside of the state and there are some large resources here that can be developed. But the other interesting thing is to look at, you know, there's this whole question about landowner um, issues and uh, the access to land and so forth and I know there's a lot of publicity given to this. but if you look at some of the numbers in Queensland, for example, despite all of that hubbub out there, in reality, there's the latest numbers, in fact, are bigger than the 2,637 shown on the chart, but 2,900 signed land access agreements in Queensland. The number is a lot less than New South Wales because that reflects where we are as an industry here. But things are happening and, uh, and there are agreements being signed between farmers and landholders. You look at the number of employees, the latest figures I've seen in Queensland, there's now 18,500 people employed in the CSG industry in Queensland. Um, and you know, you'd have to reflect in New South Wales that there's something of a lost opportunity here with only 332 people being employed in the industry here in New South Wales. Again, reflecting its relatively low state of development here. Um, so look, I just wanted to point out that you know, while you've heard a lot of stuff happening in the public domain, you've seen a lot of media and so forth, in reality this is a tale of two states. Things are going ahead in Queensland, Things are being, projects are being developed. Those projects, those three CSG to LNG projects are being developed, not just for export but also incidentally there's a lot of domestic gas uh, development occurring in Queensland, less so here in New South Wales. Very quickly, shale gas. Um, it's in Australia still in its infancy. I mentioned before that resource of about 400 uh, trillion cubic feet needs further study, but there are nonetheless some very promising signs in uh, predominantly in the Cooper Basin in South Australia where uh, it's been an oil and gas province for many, many years, so its characteristics are very, very well known. It's connected into some local infrastructure and in actual fact, just two weeks ago indeed, we had the first um, shale gas well 
put into commercial production by Santos, connecting into its existing infrastructure. So <clears throat> in Cooper Basin, we've already got a development occurring. The other prospective areas are other parts of the Cooper Basin, in the Canning Basin in, uh, in northwest of Western Australia, and also in the Perth Basin, which is a, a basin which extends north of Perth up towards Geraldton, Geraldton and, then, and south. Finally, in Northern Territory, there's also some interest in development of shale gas resources there. So it's an early story, but uh, there are some promising signs. Will we be able to match the US growth story? That's going to be a question of fundamentally about geology. And there's been very few shale gas provinces in the world which have matched the essential geology which has occurred in the US. So that remains to be seen, but there are some promising signs. All right, finally now looking at some of the, um, the key policy, policy issues confronting the industry. Um, in a, a recent report, um, we had Deloitte's Access Economics do some work which measured the economic significance of this industry for Australia's future. And I skipped over it on one of the earlier charts, but the contribution to GDP by, by this industry in Australia now is about 2%. That's set to grow to about 3.5% uh, by 2020. Net added value is now around about $29 billion. Again, by 2020, that's set to grow to about $65 billion. So it's a, um, you know, it's a big economic contribution. But as I've mentioned on the way through, we do have some challenges. Uh, the first one is high development costs. Um, we do have um, some large uh, uh, development costs here, relatively speaking. If you look at some of the cost curves of projects around the world, Australia tends to be at the higher end. That would be okay if we could match that with increased productivity. Labour productivity is an issue for us on being able to develop and execute some of these major projects. So we know as an industry we have some work to be done there. Um, accessing skilled labour is a major issue. There's a great reluctance, I'm sure you've all seen yourselves, from people to be prepared to move from the southeastern corner of this country up into these new areas of opportunity in the northwest and even as far, you know, not very far away a place like Gladstone. I know that one of the project um, chief executives is very frustrated with the fact that he can't get people to move from Cairns even down to uh, Gladstone to take jobs on some of these major coal seam gas developments. So accessing skilled labour is a major issue for us and one where there's a lot of work being spent on not only developing local workforce but also looking at how we can make it attractive for people to move from the southeastern corner and keep open access to international pools of labour. Finally, um, I've, I've mentioned the social licence to operate but finally the one I wanted to touch on was uh, stable, predictable government policy settings. There's been uh, and here really it's a question of there's been a number of changes which we've made at a government policy level to taxation settings which affect the fiscal incentives for these major projects in this country. Um, we've had, for example, in rapid succession, you will have heard a lot about the minerals resource rent tax, I'm sure. Uh, in the industry, pre in this industry pre-existing all of the offshore projects had applied to them, apart from the North West Shelf project, had applied to them a petroleum resource rent tax different kind of ta similar kind of tax in concept with different provisions around it. That's now been spread to onshore, all those onshore developments that I've described. The second thing is that, you know, I talked about the competitive environment in which we operate and the competitors for Australia are really not the OECD countries, they're the customers. It's really the, the other supplying countries and we have introduced a carbon tax which adds to the cost structure of all of those projects. The third thing is uh, one I won't go into detail on, but there is a, a current move under a government task force known as the Business Tax Working Group to be looking at some of the, in, in exchange, if you like, for a, uh, an across-the-board cut in company tax within the economy, to be looking at, they're targeting some sectoral uh, taxation issues which would apply specifically in the resources sector, which really will make the game a lot tougher for uh, those projects which I've described. And finally, I'll just mention environmental approvals. We have very high standards in Australia, there's nothing wrong with that, but we need to make sure that the approvals that we put in place 
um, don't raise regulatory burdens too highly and also impact on the timeliness of delivery of those projects because, as I mentioned on the way through, it's our capacity to be able to participate or take advantage of the opportunities in that window that really is going to serve us well for the long term. Thanks very much.